mental distortions. We must understand that serious depression may distort certain aspects of our reality. Here now is Gene to explain. We see this principle dramatically illustrated in the life of Elijah. Distorted reality. Let's pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. He, that is Elijah, entered a cave there. That was at Mount Horeb. Remember, he went in the strength of the rest that he had and the food that he ate, the nourishment, the rest. He entered a cave there at Mount Horeb. He spent the night. And then the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, let me point out something. Elijah is ready for that question because things are happening in his life. And the Lord now is going to get more specific because of the nourishment, because of what's happened to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. I want us to uh, look at what he said point by point. And we want to see reality, but we want to see distortion of reality. Notice what he said, first of all. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. That's true. He had been very zealous. Boy, look over the last three years of his life. Look what he went through. Look what happened on Mount Carmel. Look at the stand that he took. That's true. That's reality. But notice next. He says, the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. Yes, they have. There's no question they had. Now, there's a form of distortion here in that they had come to the place where they said, Lord, you are God. Lord, you are God. But the fact is that they had abandoned the covenant. But he looked back and he didn't see the progress they were making. He felt like he had been a failure. There was a distortion there. Then he goes on to say, they've torn down your altars. Yes, they had. That's a true statement. They had torn down the altars of God. Up there on Mount Carmel, that, that altar had been torn down. That's why he had to rebuild the altar before he actually called on the Lord, you know, to come down and demonstrate his power. That was a true statement. And they've killed your prophets with the sword. Yes, they had. Yes, they had. They had killed your prophets with the sword. They had done that. And then he says, I alone am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. True statement. You know, Jezebel is out to get him. So he has statements of reality with some distortion, but there's a specific distortion that emerges. And look what it is. It's right there in this passage. I alone am left. Not true, Elijah. Not true. He felt that way. But what about his friend Obadiah that he had met on the way to Mount Carmel, and Obadiah had hid uh, the prophets in the caves. And there were a number of prophets that had never faced death. And somehow he feels like he's alone. He, can't, he just can't get a hold of that. I am alone. And there were a hundred prophets, by the way, uh, that were saved in those caves because of Obadiah. Uh, you see, Elijah was accurate in a number of these statements, no question about it, but he had distorted a very, very important reality. He was not the only one that was left. And he needed to be reassured in his depression that there were others. And, and still, there were many, many prophets that had not bowed their knee, knee to Baal. Many prophets, hundreds, that had not bowed their knee to Baal. And so, you see, God has to deal with His distortions. And when it comes to depression, we all have distortions. We distort reality. I like the uh, story in the New Testament of Thomas, uh, who certainly was not able to get a hold of reality. And, and we read about this uh, in... 
John 11, 15 and 16, and let me read this, and then I'll give you the context. I'm glad for you, Jesus said, speaking to Thomas and the others, I'm glad for you, but particularly you, Thomas, that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But then Thomas says, but let's go to him, that is, to Lazarus. Then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, Okay, let's just go down there that we may die with him. Now that is depression, it's fear, it's distortion. The fact of the matter is, see, they had just come from Bethany where Lazarus lived and Lazarus had died. And they got the word that he was dead. And Jesus delayed so he would be dead for four days in the tomb and then he was going to go back and raise him from the dead. But before that, Jesus had been in Jerusalem and they took stones and tried to stone Jesus and the apostles and they just disappeared. And God had protected them. And Thomas forgot. He couldn't remember the power of God that he experienced there in Jerusalem and throughout Jesus' work on earth. This was getting towards the end of his life on earth. So he just says, let's go and die with him. Now that's distortion. Uh, that's depression. That's fear. Uh, and so it's normal. We all face that kind of situation in our lives. Uh, the question, I think, that we need to think about in terms of application is this. What are some of the normal situations in life that cause depression? And in what ways do these negative feelings distort reality? Well, I think all of us can remember times when we distort reality. Um, I, I can think about that in my own life. It's so easy to generalize. Uh, for example... And I don't just have to be tired <laughs> to distort this reality. Let's say that I have a serious attack on me. And I've had a few serious attacks on me in my years of ministry. An email that's scathing. Uh, or a letter. Uh, when I get a letter like that, uh, I second-guess myself very quickly. And I say, what in the world? Am I doing wrong? Uh, you know, you get down. You get down on yourself. And by the way, one of the things that I have learned when I've been confronted with somebody who's been out of shape and who's on a personal attack, a personal vendetta for some reason, I'll go to my brothers and say, help me out. Is this my problem? You see, I'm highly relational by nature. And so... It's very easy for me, rather than rationalizing and blaming somebody else, I take it on myself and I overreact and blame myself in areas where at times I shouldn't blame myself. By the way, I'd rather have that problem than the other problem where you just rationalize and say, that's your problem, not mine. Because a lot of times that's the way we deal with accusations. We blame somebody else. We don't learn. But the fact of the matter is I'm vulnerable in that area. I remember one guy coming out of a message that I had delivered in the church. And man, I got outside in the lobby and he just hit me. Uh, this was between two services. He hit me with a barrage of criticism and just tore into me. And uh, several elders were standing around after he left. And I said, guys, man, I need help. I mean, I'd just been run over with a semi and I, what you know, Help me out here. And they were able to say, Gene, this is not your problem. This is his problem. And they reminded me that this guy had had a lot of problems. And I had known that, but I tended to forget. And I needed reassurance. You know, what I was doing, I was distorting reality. Now, when I'm tired, I can really distort reality. When I'm physically exhausted, I can really distort reality. And I need reassurance. And we all do in those cases. So uh, it doesn't take an Elijah's experience to have a Jezebel after us, although that's rather threatening. But uh, it doesn't take that kind of thing where somebody's out to kill you to distort reality. Uh, we're human, and that can happen. So uh, let's remember this principle. 
we must understand that serious depression may distort certain aspects of our reality. 